Hi everyone, should we make a start? Um, so first of all, good afternoon and thank you all so much for coming along to this talk. This one is about applying to Newcastle, so it is the, uh, the view from the inside. So my name is Adam Thoburn and I'm the Undergraduate Admissions Manager here at Newcastle University and we are also joined by Sarah Rennick who is our team leader for undergraduate admissions as well. So as part of this talk, we'll be looking at um, numbers, so basically the ratio of how many applications we get to places, and um, the process and offer making, so how Newcastle University make their decisions, uh, personal statement and reference, so touching upon the importance of those and what we can do to improve them, um, our approach uh, in terms of Newcastle University's approach to admissions, and then finally preparing for results day, clearing and adjustment. And I know that that seems like a really, really long way away, um, but it is useful just to touch upon as well. At the end, we should have time for some questions as well. Um, so if we could just store questions up for the end, then we'll be happy to take them then. So here at Newcastle University, um, in undergrad admissions, we look after all of undergrad admissions. So other universities do it differently, but we look after home UK, um, EU and international applications as well. As we can see from this slide, we have around about 6,000 undergraduate places available per year and we receive around about 32,000 applications. So that's roughly between five and six applications per place available at the university. Now, something that I do want to address is that um, there was a lot of press reporting over the summer about um, everything in terms of the A-level results, how they uh, were generated in August. Some universities were then having to ask applicants to move to September 2022. What I can assure you is that is not the case here at Newcastle. So we were really, really, really careful in terms of our offer making to make sure that that exact scenario did not happen so that we were filling up September 2022 with people who previously applied. So I just wanna make sure that everyone's aware that you are not in any way, shape or form at a disadvantage because you're coming through now. There's still plenty of plenty of spaces available. So if we use that sort of five to six applications per place analogy. It's obviously quite sort of broad stroke, and we obviously do have some courses that are more popular than others. So here we can see that we've listed business courses, dentistry, fine art, medicine, and psychology as well. Now, this is just an alphabetical list, so this doesn't rank them in terms of how many applications each subject area got. And um, But if we use medicine, as an example, so five to six applications per place, broad stroke. If we look at medicine, that's more like 10 applications per place for a UK applicant. And if it were to be an international applicant, because we've got specific um, NHS quotas to work within, that's actually more like 24 um, applications per place available. So the message here is if, the, if you reply into these courses, great but really do pay attention to things that are going to set you apart, things like the personal statement, um, things like your attention to detail when you've gone through the online prospectus, because those things will set you apart, and especially for those courses um, that are very, very competitive. Now, it's um, not like that across the whole picture. So if we use other brilliant degree programs that can lead to fantastic career opportunities, things like natural sciences, environmental sciences, engineering, as well, um, they don't attract as many applications as the ones that are listed on this slide. So it's like, well, it's a little bit more likely that if you were to apply for those subject areas, you stand a little bit of a better chance of receiving an offer. So in terms of the actual process, it looks very, very easy according to this slide. You basically apply, you receive your offers, you then decide which universities you wish to accept, you get your results, and then finally you've secured your place of jobs are good. And if we talk a little bit more in depth about each one of those tiles though, so if we start with apply, that is the place that you're currently at at the moment. So that is um, doing your research, whittling down which universities, which courses you would like to apply to, going and having a look at online prospectuses, coming to visit days such as this you will then submit your application through UCAS. Now, UCAS have a couple of deadlines to watch out for. First one is if you're applying to medicine and dentistry, your UCAS deadline will be the 15th of October. 
if you are also applying to Oxbridge, so Oxford or Cambridge, then your deadline also will be the 15th of October. But if you're not applying to medicine, dentistry or Oxbridge, then your deadline will be the 26th of January. So you'll submit your application through UCAS and those applications then simultaneously will be sent to however many different universities you've applied to. So let's say you've applied to five. UCAS will then send your application on your behalf to those five different institutions and they will probably tackle that application a little bit differently. So some universities will send all applications through to an academic admissions tutor for review. Other universities will have a centralised admissions department who review all applications. Here at Newcastle, we do a little bit of both. So some go across to academic admissions tutors, others we will make within undergrad admissions, we will make the decisions. And if we aren't in a position to make a decision, if we do need some academic input, then we will refer them over to the academic admissions tutor. So hopefully off the back of that, you'll then receive lots and lots of offers. It's then over to you, so that third tile, you then decide, and your decision is basically which university you are going to place as your firm choice, your first choice, and which university you will place as your insurance choice, and think of insurance as sort of like a backup, as an insurance policy. You will then get your results, you'll hopefully meet the terms and conditions of your firm place university, and you'll secure your place. If for whatever reason, you have, you've missed grades and your firm choice can't confirm you, your insurance choice hopefully will be in a position to confirm. If they can't do it, any applicant who isn't confirmed by their firm choice or by their insurance choice, they then enter clearing so then they can have a look and see which courses across the UK are still available and submit applications through the clearing process. So. Megan offers, what do we need to look for? Unfortunately, it's just not possible to make every single applicant an offer. And there's a few reasons behind that. Um, the first one is noted there, so it's quotas. So again, think about medicine, think about dentistry. It is due to NHS funded programs. So we are told specifically how many places we have available and that will impact how many offers we can then make. Also student experience, so in terms of capacity and staff student ratios, you don't want to be attending a course that is oversubscribed, so lecture theatre similar to this one, uh, over capacity, you don't want to be trying to access a lab, so if you're studying computer sciences and you can't get into a computing lab, or music and you can't enter a rehearsal space because there's just too many people on your course, that will all lead to a negative student experience. And the same can be said for the staff student ratios. So if we use the example of like a personal tutor, um, what you don't want to be doing is attending a course uh, where there's um, a personal tutor who has so many more tutees to look after when you are seeking their support, when you're trying to arrange an appointment, they've got a backlog of people that they also need to see. Again, that will lead to a negative student experience. And then finally, quality. So we're trying to make sure that it's the right course and that you'll be successful. So if you use the example of history, and for history, you need an A-level in history or your access to HE needs to be linked to history, etc. Um, if you don't have that, then it's likely that we won't be able to make you an offer because you need those building blocks in order to progress onto the degree. Now, I've made it sound there like we, uh, we don't make many offers, but in all honesty, um, it's the opposite. So we try and make as many people happy here at Newcastle University as we can. So what do we look for? How do we decide? So initially, we look for the right students for the right courses. We look at your actual grades, if you've already got your exams, or we look at your predicted grades, if you're due to sort of take them in the run-up to August when they are released. Um, and also, going back to that point, appropriate subject for the course. So if you need to have studied A-level maths, for instance, and you're currently not studying that, or similar, like in an equivalent level three qualification, 
Um, that's the type of thing that we look for. If we can see that you've got that information, then that shows to us, that shows to any admissions department that you've done your research, you've read online prospectuses, you've invested the time to go through and sort of plan in terms of you know that it's likely that you know, you're asked to have studied biology and chemistry at A-level and you know that you currently hold that. Um, other things that are important, personal statement as well as the reference as well. So in terms of personal statements, one thing I will say is that I don't want people falling into a trap of thinking that the personal statement is only used in order to sort of act as that gateway to get you an offer. Um, because that's true to an extent, but the personal statement is used right the way throughout the admissions process. So let's say that you are attending a, a course, you're applying for a course that also has an interview. So let's say that the, you know it's medicine or let's say that it's music. It's very likely that your personal statement will play a part in that. So people would have read your personal statement. So don't just write the personal statement, submit it to UCAS and forget about it keep on going back to your personal statement, review it, make sure that it's fresh, make sure that you know what you've written down, because if there is an interview scenario, some things that you've mentioned in there may come up, so be prepared to answer those. Um, another point about the personal statement is that if, for instance, we've made an AAB offer and it comes to result today and you've got ABB, if you are a near miss applicant and if there is still capacity available remaining on the course we'll then go back to personal statements so if for instance let's say that there's small capacity on the course and there's 20 people who all have abb it'll come down to things like personal statements it'll come down to references so don't fall into the trap of just believing that personal statement is this sort of only used at the front end of the process because it's used right the way throughout and it's things like that that can really set you aside from other applicants. So what do we look for? Um, enthusiasm for the subject and I'm sure that lots and lots of people will tell you that but it's true and it does make a difference and it does jump off a piece of paper. So if you tell us why you're enthusiastic, how long you've been enthusiastic for, which particular aspect of a subject um, makes you enthusiastic about this, which component, then that will all come across. Work experience, hobbies or volunteering work, it says on the slide there, particularly if related to the course, which if it's related, great. Things like dentistry, they may take that type of thing into account. It may count towards the application process. Even if your work experience, your volunteering work or hobby is not related to the course, list it though, because what that enables admissions departments to do is to sort of get a clearer idea of who's at the other end of the application. So even if it is sort of work experience and it's not related, put it down because that can illustrate that there's time management, that there's communication skills being used, you know, that you're, you're going out, you're volunteering. So it can help to set people apart. Skills and personal qualities. Um, message here is don't be shy. So let us know exactly how good you are. And remember that university is sort of a two-way street. So yes, when you come to university, will you have a good experience and will you exit with a degree? Absolutely. But also universities benefit as well from the people, from the people who come and help to form the new part of the community that we build. So let us know what skills and personal qualities you can add to that community. Um, there's a point there, a bit of personality. And the reason that we say a bit of personality rather than loads of personality is that um, you could um, write an opening line and it could be um, with the intention of it being quite humorous. It could be the best joke you've ever written. Um, not everyone's gonna find that funny. Like you may find, find it funny, I may find it funny here at Newcastle University, but other universities might not, or someone who sat in a law office may not. Um, so basically just be a little bit careful if you are gonna use humor, that's absolutely fine. I would advise that you don't put it sort of as your very first line though, because it can lead people to think, is that person taking this process seriously type thing. And also deferred entry as well. So um, you've got the option on UCAS to apply for September 2022 or September 2023. If you're applying for 23 entry, just let us know why. 
So is it because you um, do want to obtain more work experience? Is it because you are looking for employment to build up funds ahead of joining university? Um, Pre-pandemic, a popular one would have been sort of gap year, but we are seeing um, that not so much being the case at this moment in time. But if you are applying for 23 entry, then just let us know why. Um, final point that I will say about personal statements, well, really it's two. Um, when teachers, friends, family, are saying personal statements are quite important. Um, they really mean it, and it's absolutely true. Because if we use that example of, you know, it could come down to the reuse of your personal statement at the point of you've got your results, it's hugely important. So when people are saying that it's important, don't leave it to the last minute, make sure that someone else reads over it, believe them and follow their advice, it is good advice. Um, the second thing that I'll say about personal statements is UCAS use um, plagiarism detection software. So if you've got a friend who's recently just gone to university and you've asked for a look at their personal statements, if there's an older sibling in the family where you've asked them, you know, can, can have a look at yours, please, please, please do not be tempted to copy and paste big chunks because that gets flagged by UCAS and then the universities that you've applied to are then informed, so you don't want a black mark against your name before anyone's had a chance to even assess your application. Please make sure that your personal statement is your own work. So moving on to references, do they count? Of course. So similar to personal statements, it allows us to have a little bit of context about you. So what we get is schools and colleges, they'll often comment on their policy, so how big um, the college or school is, um, what type of level three qualifications um, they run on the curriculum, whether or not it's A-levels, IB, whether or not there's been a recent switch from A-level to IB and the school's currently going through sort of like a transitional phase, all of that information is useful. Um, suitability for the course, now it's very rare nowadays in fact, I'm pretty sure that we, we just have not seen a bad reference come through for quite a while. They're all glowing. Um, but what um, schools and colleges will comment on is your suitability for the course that you're applying for. So they'll possibly dig a little bit deeper in that third bullet point as well in terms of strengths in different subjects. Rather than just saying they're really good at maths, they're really excelling in maths, they'll drill down it. So it could be sort of applied maths. It could be sort of the stats Based element of your A level that you're excelling in, they'll let us know. And again, that is all additional useful context for universities. Um, ability in other qualifications being taken. So, as part of your UCAS application, you are welcome to list that you are studying an EPQ, an extended project qualification. If, however, you have not listed that, um, there's every chance that your referee will have done that. So, if you've forgotten, your referee may have included that. It is an important point to note that for some courses at Newcastle University, we may make sort of a dual offer to recognise things like EPQs. So the typical offer could be AAB or ABB with an A in the EPQ, and that's just to sort of recognise that you have taken on a little bit extra work. To find out that information, if you just have a look on our online prospectus, it'll tell you whether or not the course recognises um, the EPQ and whether or not we do tend to vary our offer. So all of that information is available online. And finally, extracurricular involvement. So again, you may cover this on your personal statement, but again, it's just an opportunity uh, for it to be listed by a referee. So basically, what have you brought to the, the school? Have you, have you played for a school team? Have you been involved in productions? Do you do things outside a school within the community? They too will list things there. So in terms of place or no place, when it comes to result today. So going back to that um, that scenario, offer was AAB and you achieved ABB. What do we look at? How do we decide? So we first of all ask ourselves the question, have you met the conditions of your offer? For those people who meet the conditions of their offer, then that's absolutely fine. Their place is confirmed. If you haven't, if you've narrowly missed, if you are uh, what's deemed a near miss, we'll then ask ourselves, do we within the course have capacity? If we do, then that's the scenario that we were discussing earlier, whereby we may go back to personal statements, we may go back to references, we may look back through your entire UCAS application form to see if there is capacity, and if you have narrowly missed, 
whether or not it's still possible to accept you. And in that sort of scenario of there's a handful of places and there's 20 people who all hold ABB, it goes back to that, is it your personal statement that sets you apart and why really you really do need to sort of invest time and effort in doing that. So our approach to admissions, we, our aim is to admit great students from diverse backgrounds and countries who'll succeed on our courses. So going back to that sort of 6,000 um, degree places that we have at the university, around about 700 of those will go to national students from about 132 different countries. Um, our approach is to give you an excellent applicant experience. It's to give you what you need in order to make an informed decision. So events like today, the use of the online prospectus, getting in touch with undergraduate admissions um, via email or via phone if you've got an answer and receiving, if, you, if you've got a question rather, and receiving a, a timely answer. Um, and also to use contextual information in our offer making. So an example of that is uh, something like our partners program. So if you're applying through partners, um, depending on whether or not you're eligible for the partners program, it could mean that we can make you um, a lower academic offer um, subject to you uh, making Newcastle University firm choice as well as attending our summer school as well. And then finally, um, if you choose Newcastle University as your first choice, then extra consideration at results time is given if you don't quite meet the results that are required. So that goes back to what we were just saying, that near miss scenario. We recognize as a university that if you've made us firm choice, then you've made a commitment to the university basically. And this is us trying to sort of honor that commitment and give something back. So we don't use, and I know it's a buzzword after a couple of years ago, but we don't use like algorithms when it comes to results. When it's results day, we have every single applicant's individual results. And it's the job of our team to go through all of them and look at them as individuals. So there's no such thing as a bad pile or a good pile. There's no such thing as just having a look in sort of, there's a, there's a line in the sand, there's a cut-off point. We go through everyone's application and look at it as a, as a person, basically, rather than just a software program going over it. So to recognise where applicants do make Newcastle University firm, we do ensure that it's not just the case of that person hasn't met the terms of their offer. We'll try and fight your corner we'll go to the academic selectors if there's capacity, we'll have those conversations if it's a near miss, or if you know, you've know you got a particularly brilliant personal statement, that's what we're gonna be championing in the summer. So that's what that point means. So as we said, it's a very, very long way away, but in terms of preparing for results day, clearing and adjustment, um, the first piece of advice that we can give is to, to do your preparation upfront. So, Going towards results day, whenever that may be, um, the idea is for yourself to keep on checking university websites, make a list of universities that you may feel that you would like to talk to on results day, and um, make a list of their telephone numbers as well, because it, it sounds really, really simple to say, but it saves time on the day itself by having all the contact numbers and the universities in place. Um, second point, be realistic. So if it's for an area like medicine, we've just touched upon how competitive medicine is. Um, a tip is in the run-up to um, results day, have a look at university websites because they will often list um, courses that they anticipate to go into clearing. It's very unlikely for an area such as medicine to go into clearing. It's not unheard of, but it is unlikely. So in terms of being realistic, just prepare yourself. By all means, going back to point one, have that list, have a list of telephone numbers, come have a conversation, phone us when it comes to phone lines opening, but just prepare yourself that because of the popularity of particular programs, they just may not be available in clearing. And then finally, when you have your results, contact us as soon as you can. So last year, UCAS opened at 8.30 for our applicants to see whether or not they had their places confirmed. For whatever reason, if your firm choice or if your insurance choice haven't been able to confirm you, and you do find yourself in clearing, basically get in touch with universities as soon as you can on that day. So UCAS opened at half eight 
um, in August 2021, and we opened our phone lines at the same time and our live chat operation as well, so people could get in touch with us immediately. So now it's over to sort of questions. Now we're more than happy to, to do this in two ways, depending on how people want to do it. Um, we can take them and we can address them um, from the floor. So if anyone would like to ask a question, um, then happy to answer that as part of a group. Um, myself and Sarah, we will be staying around um, after the session though. So if your question is a little bit more personal and you feel that you, know, you, you don't want to sort of A, ask it in this, setting um but be you'd prefer to actually speak to us um then by all means you can come and find sarah and myself we'll just be hanging around here at the end of the session so can i ask does anyone at this moment in time have a question that they would like to answer yep um oh sorry does before i come to you sorry we've had one question through on the live stream mm -hmm. um which is um is it possible for an international student to apply via ucas Absolutely. So all international applications will be uh, submitted through UCAS, adhering to those UCAS deadlines that we just touched upon. So either the 15th of October, if it's medicine or dentistry, or the 26th of January, if it's any other programme. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to check my understanding on something you uh, mentioned at the beginning, and that was about... Um, how applications are processed and i think you said that some go to academic admissions tutors and some are done centrally could you t say a little bit more about sent to the academic tutors and which are done centrally yeah absolutely so um in terms of medicine and dentistry central admissions here at newcastle university we are the centralized admissions department Medicine and dentistry, um, they are processed by dedicated admissions teams based in the Faculty of Medical Sciences for medicine and dentistry. And they've um, obviously got additional things such as UCAT scores to consider um, interviews as well. There used to be um, the, the multiple tests um, that were set up. So things like that, heavy, heavy, heavy academic involvement. Um, at the start of each cycle, so it's not a case that your application, if it is reviewed by central admissions, is you know just reviewed by central admissions. At the start of every cycle, we as a team go out to the academic units, we discuss the prospectus, we see when they would like to view the application. So let's, for instance, say that... Um, GCSE Maths B is a requirement, um, but this person is studying an A-level that could potentially compensate. That will be agreed at the start of the cycle between admissions and academic selectors, so we could send those through. If it's a very, very clear cut for the vast majority, so things like music um, and fine art, where the architecture, the expertise just does not lie within admissions, they would all go over to the academic school. Um, but when, let's use, so f philosophy is a course um, that I look after. Um, for philosophy, I know what the admissions criteria is. I've had that conversation with my academic about when they would like to see the application and when they are happy for central admissions to process. And that's basically the way that it works. So things that absolutely do need academic consideration where the skill set does not lie within the centralized admissions team, and rightly so, they all go to the academic schools, but we all work to criteria um, that's agreed, pre-agreed with academics, which is basically, this is the criteria. Are you happy to make for admissions to make offers? Yes. When do you want to see the application? And those tend to be the ones where if as an admissions team, we're a little bit unsure or we think, well, actually have a look at this personal statement. We, you know, technically, do they fall outside of the criteria? Yes. But we really think that this person's worth having a look. Could you do that? That's an instance where we'd send it over. Does that answer the question? Perfect. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Yep. Just while I'm making my way around, we've had another question through on the live stream, which is from a family who are currently living abroad. Um, they're going to be relocating to the UK um, when their uh, chapter is going to be applying to university for 2022 entry. They want to know if um, the applicant would be considered um, a home student or an international student? Yeah, that's a really, really good question and one that's quite, um, it, it's not easy to answer because it all depends on um, how long away from the UK um, someone has been, whether or not they've maintained links with the UK. Um, the easiest thing to do is that email address 
um, that's on screen now, if you could send us an email, uh, we have what's called a fee questionnaire. We'll get back to you with that fee questionnaire. It's quite short, um, but you just need to provide us with a little bit more information about the circumstances, and then we'll be in a better position to advise whether or not, um, because universities follow government guidance so it's not just the university's decision we're having to use government guidelines so we'll be able to compare your fee questionnaire with the current uh, government guidance and be able to advise whether or not it would be home or international for fees yeah. hi there uh, just during your talk you mentioned um this partners program i just wondered if you could just let us know i've never heard of that what, what is the partners program sorry i'm not too sure you mentioned in your talk something about a partners program. Oh, partners program. Yeah, yeah I'm absolutely. Sorry, I've just never heard of it before. I just wondered if you could just very quickly just tell us what it was about. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank so, um, partners, a lot of universities have widening participation schemes. Um, Newcastle University's own is called the Partners Program. So in order to be eligible for partners, there's a lot of eligibility criteria, and it's not that you need to meet all points. I think there's around about 12 points. Um, but you need to sort of meet one of them. So it could be based on postcode. It could be based on you potentially the first person to attend university in your family. Um, there's a variety of different criteria. It could be based on a previous eligibility for free school meals. If you are eligible for partners, then the university can make you a partner's offer. So if the standard offer was AAB, we could potentially make you a, a, a a dropped offer which would likely be BBC but the caveat to that is that you a need to make Newcastle University your firm choice and B um, you need to attend our summer school so the summer school is basically an academic program um, that sort of helps to um, give you a, a bit of a fast track to the start of university if you successfully complete um, that summer school and then you meet the terms of the offer, so in that instance, the BBC, then you'd be admitted onto the programme. But there's lots more information based online. So if you just go onto the uh, Newcastle University website, search for partners, come up with the, uh, the full eligibility um, criteria, including uh, a postcode checker as well to see whether or not, um, but just based on postcode alone, you'd be eligible for the programme. Does that answer the question? Perfect one that's just come through on the live stream as well. Um, so we've got somebody ask, uh, to what extent should um, subject kind of grades and offer grades differ between the five university choices? Okay, um, so that's, that's quite, a, quite a good question. So in terms of subjects, ideally you want to study a subject at university. Now within your personal statement, you can only tailor that personal statement for like maybe a an area. If you use medicine and biomed um, as an example, if you are applying for medicine but you're reserving one of your choices for biomed because a lot of biomed programs have sort of a transfer option after year one, you may want to write your personal statement just for medicine and then you may want to, if Newcastle University were to be your biomed choice, you may want to send a separate personal statement to the admissions office using that email address so then we can attach that to the application but there's no broad stroke guidance in terms of um you know you should start uh, one of your choices should be you know in a university that's asking for three a's and um, your fifth university should be a university that's um that you're likely to get an offer of sort of three c's and above there's no sort of general guidance that we would give such as that i think it really comes down to you research in the universities you sort of coming along to things like open days and being on campus and then you making the decision about how you actually uh, which universities and which courses you'd actually wish to apply to rather than focusing too much on and it sort of hedge bets so to speak by sort of having some top tariff universities and then some low tariff universities great thank you do you expect the cases in 2022 to be much higher than it was before the pandemic because of factors like last year, not everybody being able to get onto a course because there were so many that got the higher grades and because people not taking gap years and those sorts of reasons? That's a really, really good question. Um, because of the pandemic, no. 
Um, but the reason why I would answer yes to the question is because of the birth rate. So the birth rate in 2000 was really low. So entry to university in 2018 um, wasn't as competitive as it is now, this year. But post 2000, we saw the birth rate going up and up. Um, so UCAS reported last year that it was a record number of applications that they received. That's correct. Would I expect it to be another record this year? Yes, I would. Um, but that's based on sort of how many 17 to 18 year olds are in the country as opposed to that. What I would say though, is that now is still a really good time to apply to university. Because if we look at that sort of birth rate, it picks up even more going forward. So coming to university in September 2022 or September 2023 is going to be a lot less competitive as it will be in sort of future years. So yeah, it's probably, we're probably in the next few years gonna see the same amount of places, but even more demand. So is it more competitive than pre-pandemic? Yes, but I think that's more to do with the birth rate. Uh, we haven't seen an increase in people who hold offers and then say, actually, can I defer to the previous year? It's still in line with pre-pandemic numbers. And going back to the point, have, you know, have we filled lots and lots of places up for September 2022 because of what's happened this summer? The answer is no, because we, we, we work really, really carefully with our planning department. And in terms of offer making strategy, made sure that this current cohort weren't going to be disadvantaged in any way. Does that answer? Great, thank you. So sorry, just one other question. In, um, I just wondered in terms of when you apply, Over, I disadvantage if you apply later. So, 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 or, or do they assess wait for all the applicants to come in, application to come in, and then they decide whether to make interviews or offers? Yeah, yeah. So, um, if it's okay, if this could be the last question, I'd notice that there a few other people did have questions. If we can just move outside. Um, to the sort of the foyer after this question, that would be grand. Um, but to answer, I don't think anyone's at a disadvantage. The only date that you need to keep an eye on are those UCAS deadlines. Because if you apply, so the main UCAS deadline for non-medicine, non-dentistry, if you apply after the 26th of January, um, if universities have received an influx of, of applications for, let's say, account and finance, Account and finance then can have a look and go, that's a lot of applications, that's a lot of offers. We think that we now need to remove that program from being available for application. So if you are within the, uh, the deadline period, no, I don't think it does matter. And certainly an application that's received on the 26th of January for law, I wouldn't view that application any differently to one that's been received today for law. But the one thing that you do need to keep an eye on are those standard UCAS deadlines, because if you apply after those, that's when goalposts can shift a little bit. Does that answer the question? Perfect. Thank you, everyone. So um, if anyone wants to take a note of that email address, you're welcome to. If you want to take a picture, more than happy. Um, and then anyone else, I noticed that, that there are a few people who still did have questions. So Sarah and myself will just be in the, in the sort of foyer area if you wanted to go there we'll make our way there now and more than happy to continue the conversation outside of this but once again thank you everyone for taking the time to come along today and i hope that you enjoy the rest of the day at newcastle thank you